So this video records the prototype of control board using Arduino to control uh, the six digits of a Chronomics CC3000 clock. Backing up a step, we'll just talk about these SignalX digits. This, this is a six inch SignalX seven segment display. You'll see it's made up of these veins, each seven veins, and these veins are independently controlled. The veins actually work using a permanent magnet. You'll see right here, this circular thing. I'm putting a, see how it sticks there? That circular thing is a permanent magnet. Behind the permanent magnet, in this uh, plastic case, there's a, there's a coil. It's a center tapped coil, so there's three wires from each coil. So there's three wires from each, each coil. There's seven coils, there's 21 wires coming out of this. Um, that's a lot of wire. You'll see it here at the bottom. It's a big hunk of wire. And if you put 10 digits inside of a little box for a race clock, that's a whole lot of wires. So you open up one of these clocks, it's a big mess. But it, they're fairly well organized and the, the cable is manageable. Although this one was actually damaged in a couple places because the control board, the original control board had melted and melted some of the wires. Back to the center tapped coils, there's a wire in the center of this coil and the wire in the center is plus, positive 12 volts. If I ground one side, that causes current to flow between the center tap and that, that, uh, that ground and that'll flip it one way. If I ground the other side, then I'll flip it the other way. If I ground both, uh, probably do nothing, although the behavior is undefined if you ground both at the same time. It's not a good idea. The, uh, the idea here is to activate it, it takes about 90 milliseconds. So for 90 milliseconds, you provide current to flip it and then you stop. And then once it's in its, its spot, it doesn't require any current anymore, which means this is a very uh, low power device. It's good for running on batteries. Uh, once it's flipped, it doesn't require power to stay in the state it's in. Unlike, for instance, an LED clock, which requires power to constantly illuminate the LEDs. We have 21 wires coming out the bottom. Talk about those for a second. In this case, the black wires are the center taps, and they're all at plus 12 volts. So in this case, if I find it, trace it back, you'll find in a spot right here in this case, those seven black wires are all joined together, all soldered together into one wire. So on the actual connector, there's a, this is a 16 pin connector of which only 15 pins are used. One of those pins is the plus 12 volts. Seven pins are for grounding one side of a coil and you'll see an orange and red and the orange pin, the seven orange wires are for grounding the other sides of the coil. I take these into a pair of current drivers. Because these have to, these are working at plus 12, uh, plus 12 volts and at a higher current level than you typically experience at TTL, at uh, logic levels, you can't control it directly from a microcontroller. You need a current driver. So these two chips, let's focus in on them, are, uh, are current drivers. On this side, where you see the or these orange, thin orange wires, those are the logic level wires, and they control what, vol what ground will appear in here. And it's a mapping on the pin is very simple. This wire here will control uh, whether this wire is grounded. So that way by controlling whether these are uh, five volts or zero volts, uh, logic one or logic zero, you control what that, uh, that particular vein will do on the seven segment display. So I'm gonna pan along. We've been talking about the one digit, but of course we've got five other digits. We've got a total of six digits. So if you look on the proto board, we'll see a whole row of current drivers. There's a few hidden under that keypad. There's a total of 12 current drivers. And you'll notice the orange, and then there's brown, and then there's blue. Mm -hmm. This is a basically a bus, a 14, a 14 wire bus, which goes all the way along here. 
until it feeds over in these yellow wires to shift registers. Those are just basic 74595 shift registers. So the idea here is the shift registers set the logic levels on this bus. So if if these if this bus is set to a set of logic levels which correspond to zero, for instance, then all of these current drivers will see zero at the same time. Now that that might seem a little weird, you're feeding the same thing to all all of these uh, digits at the same time. However, they don't the current drivers don't always read it. For the current driver has latched input, which means that when this, these pins controlled by this little green wire, when those pins are logic zero, the chip will just ignore the input. When these pins, when these two green pins are logic one, then these chips will read the inputs, store them internally, and uh, that's when they'll latch it. So if I, if I strobe this, it's called the strobe pin, if I strobe these pins for, this, for these two, then they will read their input and then if I br bring the strobe back to zero, they'll lock that input inside. So I can lock that one. I can send a, a digit along the bus. I'll call it the data bus. I can send a set of a combination along the data bus. I can strobe these ones so they read it. And then I can send a different digit and strobe these ones so they read it send a different digit strobe these ones and so on so each digit gets strobed independently so you'll see the strobe wire goes back to the microcontroller each pair of current drivers have their own strobe control which goes back to the microcontroller might seem like a difficult difficult way of doing it but it's very simple to do and in fact the serial the serial uh, bus on this microcontroller works at four megahertz. So I can strobe these pins. I can, I can make this happen so fast that uh, perceptually a human wouldn't be able to tell that they're being done, yeah, that there's a time delay between them. It would be, let me put it this way, it would be the delay between strobing these pins will be much, much smaller than the actual precision, uh, the display precision of this clock, which is maybe plus or minus 0.5 of a second, just due to the mechanical flipping of the veins. All right, so what else should I talk about here? Uh, see this little thing here with the glowing red light? That is a temperature compensated real-time clock. Uh, we want a real-time clock on it because the Arduino microcontroller has an internal clock, but it's not very accurate. You wouldn't want to use it for a race. So you get a real-time clock. Uh, in addition to that, you need to have temperature compensated because in this race, could you could hold a race in the summer at plus 20 or plus 30 degrees Celsius. You might hold a race in the winter at negative 20 Celsius. Uh, digital clocks have some variance depending on the temperature. It's not a lot. It might be like five seconds a day, but still we want to remove that uncertainty. So we use a temperature compensated clock instead of a, a cheaper uh, DS1307, for instance, real-time clock. That's the keypad next to it. This is the original keypad from the Chronomics CC3000 clock. You'll see that internally I've taken this edge connector out. That's what it uses internally. And I've numbered it. I've numbered the conductors on the edge connector. It's a little blurry. I can't focus in that close. And I've taken one wire from each pin of the edge connector and wired it into the Arduino inputs. Now at this point I should say I'm using an Arduino Mega because I'm using so many inputs on this that uh, it, there wouldn't be enough there wouldn't be enough uh, pins on a simple Arduino to do this. So I'm doing the, using the Arduino Mega. And that's about it. So I'm going to pause it and mount the camera and then show you what it actually does. So, in actual usage, I've, I've created a, an Arduino script which will control these digits. It's the current, the Arduino is actually turned on right now. Okay, press this button, and that'll take everything back to zero. That's the split freeze button on the keypad. It starts off 
in zeros. So if you're using this uh, as a simple uh, stopwatch sort of thing for a race, you could press the start stop button and it starts counting. Two. You can use this in different uh, variations. Watch when it flips from nine to 10. You heard the click click. One of the implications of having a high current driver is it if I tried to flip every vein of every digit all at the same time, there's going to be a huge pulse of current pulled from the power supply, which could damage the power supply. And in fact, the original power supply was from the original board was melted down, basically. So that could have been what happened or it could have been something else. I wasn't there at the time. But what I've done here is I've put uh, a point, a tenth of a second delay. So you'll see this one goes from nine to zero and the tens seconds, tenth of a second later flips. So that prevents a large power draw from hitting the power supply all at one time. Uh, watch when it goes click, click, click. You'll hear it go there, click, click, click. So is that a problem? Well, it's a tenth of a second delayed, but if you were actually using this as a stopwatch, you'd be watching that. Uh, you notice I moved that one vein to one side. If a vein gets moved to one side, typically it won't get moved back again until the, um, until the clock actually has to move it. So for instance, if I were to move that out of the way, it's not going to change anything until it changes from three to four. Uh, in this case, four doesn't actually use that vein. So in that case, it won't, won't change. Now, another thing this clock can do is it can tell the time of day. So I've put this, I put a little piece of tape on and if I press this button, it'll go to the time of day. So right now it's 2.40 p.m. You notice this uh, vein here did not change correctly. I've noticed that there's a couple, this clock has been damaged and some of these digits don't work optimally anymore. That particular vein I've got a problem with and this vein as well has a bit of a problem. It could be the coil, it could be the coil that's damaged, it could be the permanent magnet has become slightly demagnetized. Uh, it's hard to tell without lot, lots more testing. But some of these digits in this clock don't work as well as they might have when it was originally purchased. So it's showing the time of day right now. Uh, in about in a few seconds, it'll probably change to 2.41. There we go. Thank you. Uh, the, the race clock is actually counting in the background still. So changing the display doesn't change the race clock. If I change it back to the stopwatch, the stopwatch has still been working in the background, so that doesn't uh, influence the stopwatch. The way the stopwatch works is the real-time clock has a 32.768 kilohertz signal, which goes to the Arduino, and the Arduino counts those ticks. So it has an accuracy of less than 0.1 milliseconds, which is pretty good. Um, it just counts those ticks. It keeps counting those ticks in the background while we're doing other stuff. It can also show the temperature. You, know, you see the, sec the other vein didn't work this time. The, because this is a temperature compensated real-time clock, there is obviously, a, there must be a thermometer temperature sensor of some type in, inside there, and we can read it. Uh, right now it's 23 degrees Celsius in my basement, which is why I just took my sweater off. It's a little warm down here. Um, and that's about it. If you were displaying this outside, it uh, might come up as negative 23 degrees C. Uh, it will do that. It'll read negative temperatures just as well as it reads uh, positive temperatures. And the thermometer is supposed to be good for it to plus or minus 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. We can go back to the, the stopwatch, stop counting. You'll notice that one didn't get uh, flipped correctly. There's a couple ways to fix that if something doesn't show up right. There's, I've got this blank button program to blank out the display. So that should go. And then if we go back to clock, 
now it's still not working. Sometimes, like I said, some of those veins don't work quite well, well enough because the digits aren't as good as they used to be. Um, what else can it do? Uh, yeah, you can set. So I'm going to stop the clock and I'm going to set it. So it changes to zeros. Suppose our race started at 1030. You can press one, zero, and notice the numbers enter from the right side and scroll across. I'm going to put that back because it's annoying. And this one too. So this race starts at 10, 1030. You get that, press enter. So now the stopwatch is set to start at 1030. You press start stop and away it goes. So if you had a race starting at 10.30, you could start it that way. Or at any other time, you could start, start your clock. I haven't programmed this for the countdown feature. It, uh, it would not be hard to do a countdown feature. Or if you wanted to set a negative time and then have it go from negative time to zero and then count up again, you could, you could do that too. And that's about it for this clock. So I'll post all my code and stuff like, and the schematic diagram for this circuit. And if uh, anyone wants to rebuild their chronomics clock, I hope this helps you along your way. Thank you very much.